It's not fair this time of year to, to talk about which city is the better city. <laughs> it just isn't. This time of year, people in the Northeast, people in New York, who make fun of Southern California secretly wish that at least they daydream about living here, but they're not going to tell you. Every February and March, they think, hmm, Southern California. So right now, you're a great global city and you have no snow, so you probably win. Uh, it's an honor and delight to be here. I am going to address the question that Brandon just talked about. Uh, we, you are all really different. And of course, in fact, it reminds me very much of uh, similar kind of meetings we have in New York City. Uh, the church is diverse, the uh, people are diverse. And so I'm going to go at this uh, question of how do you love your city? How do you, how, what does it mean to be a church in a city? Uh, and I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to be pretty comprehensive. I'm going to make you think uh, in these three talks. And I'm going to say a lot. I'm going to, each of my talks is going to have a, lot of, a, a whole lot of different points. And one of the reasons I'm doing that is because you're so diverse. Uh, every one of you needs to hear all of the points, I believe. I chose them because I think all, anyone who's a Christian, anyone who's in the church in a city needs to hear all these points. But, but depending on where you are and who you are, some of the points won't be quite as important as others. So be patient. Yeah, you'll sit there and say, yeah, not as true from where I'm sitting. The next one, wow, that's true. Uh, so I'm speaking to you all and I'm speaking comprehensively. Uh, the question, how do you love, serve, reach your city? We're gonna be looking at, at least I'm gonna be looking at it uh, in three perspectives. Uh, tonight I wanna talk about what it means to be a, uh, what it means to be a church in a city. Tomorrow morning, what it means to be a church in society. Then after that, what it means to be a church in a culture. In other words, what are the urban implications of the gospel, the social implications of the gospel, the cultural implications of the gospel? Now, there's overlap, but uh, it's one of the ways by going around and looking at it in those three ways, I think we're gonna hit everything. So right, right tonight, question, what does it mean to be a church in a city? What are the urban implications of the gospel? And I'm gonna tell you about nine things nine, that in order to be a church in the city that loves the city, you've got to be a gospel-pointed church, a heart-shaping community. You've got to be an indigenous community. You have to be a, uh, uh, a city-loving community, of course. You've got to be a contrast community, a servant community, a unifying community, a lay-equipping community, and a suffering community. Nine things. Let's go. Remember what I said, the reason I'm saying so many things is because, there's, because you're so diverse. And because even though you need, all of you need all of these, you don't all need all of them equally, and yet you need all of them. Okay, first of all, what do I mean by a gospel-pointed community? If the Christianity, all of its beliefs and all of its uh, practices, if Christianity was a surgical knife, the gospel would be the point of the knife. Because you see, if, if, the, if the knife doesn't ha has a blunt point, that, that knife's not going in. It's got to have this sharp point, then it goes in, and then it can do its job. And it's very possible to be very Christian and actually have a kind of, be pretty unclear and not very sharp in your understanding what the gospel is. The word gospel can end up meaning almost anything that's Christian. And uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, the gos what, is the, what is the gospel point? What is the point of the knife? The gospel is we're saved by Christ's work, not ours. The gospel is good news about what has been done to save you, not good advice about what you must do to save yourself. Uh, the gospel is that your relationship with God is determined by Christ's past and Christ's record, not your past and your record. Another way to put it is, we're saved by Christ's free and finished and costly work by faith alone. If you forget it's free and finished, you just, just if, you, if, if you're not right on the point, if you forget that it's free and finished, you get a couple clicks toward legalism. A couple clicks toward thinking, well, I've gotta do something. But if you forget how costly it was and what he did for you 
and how, and how now I have to live for him. Then you, you have a couple clicks toward relativism, toward saying, well, I'm saved and it doesn't really matter how I live. Just a couple clicks to the right, legalism. A couple clicks to the left, relativism. Not on point. You've got to be really clear about this. Uh, there's a whole lot of ways in which a church can have a blunt knife. Because you talk about the gospel, you don't make it extraordinarily clear to people exactly what it is and what it is not. Now, there's a lot of different ways, I think, to, to, to kind of get that bluntness. Uh, some churches are the sold out for Jesus churches. We're sold out, we're intense, we're radical. You've got to give yourself to him, you've got to surrender, and you very subtly, or maybe not so subtly, give people the impression that God loves you because you're so intense and you're so sold out. In which case, you're really saved by your intensity, not by what Jesus Christ has done. There's other churches that are good old-fashioned legalistic. We believe the Bible, but we also believe a whole lot of other things that aren't really in the Bible, but we, but we, we believe them just to be safe. And, and, and there's a, there's a self-righteousness, there's a pride, it's legalistic, it's good old-fashioned legalism. And again, uh, it's, it's really my, my compliance and my faithfulness and my doctrinal uh, fidelity. Uh, that's why God loves me. That's why I'm in a relationship with God, not the f finished work of Jesus. In fact, l listen, like I said, I'm trying to, I'm thinking about how many different kinds of people there are here. Uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, I mean, it started when I was in seminary, which is a long time ago, when I was in theological school, when people are getting a hold of the idea that the kingdom of God is a very important part of the uh, New Testament message. But it's funny, even up to now, an awful lot of people don't really know what that kingdom word means. It's thrown around a lot. And I think a lot of people have just decided the kingdom means a kind of community. And therefore, uh, there's a kind of kingdom gospel that kind of goes like this. Uh, come into the community and be united with God and, and get his life in you and then go out into the world and be an agent of reconciliation and bring people together and bring people into community. And that, is, that can end up being a kind of humanitarian legalism. If you're a really good person and you're really helping other people and you're just uniting people and bringing people together, then God is happy with you. Look, Charles Wesley, great awakening, writes that great hymn, talks about what it means to be a Christian. There's blood, there's wrath of God, but the blood of Jesus Christ. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin in nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon, the dungeon flame with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. If you sing that all the time, if that's the kind of background music to your heart, you're getting the point of the gospel. It means that you're a sinner. It means that you're under the wrath of God, except Jesus Christ came and he bought you by his blood. I mean, that's... That's the point. Not just be a great person, be sold out for the kingdom, you know, be sold out for Jesus, live a really good life. It's, it's I'm blood bought. That's what transforms, that's the gospel point. You know, there's this, uh, I always love this, there's a, a 1740, 1730s, there's a guy named Nathan Cole who was a Connecticut farmer in, uh, in, the, in, in the 1730s, 1740s, and he wrote a spiritual autobiography called Spiritual Travels, I think it is. And he talks about his uh, conversion. And he got converted listening to George Whitfield, the great Anglican evangelist, come to town and preach. And Nathan Cole said, this is exactly what he says it happened the moment he became a Christian. He says, my hearing him preach gave me a heart wound and by God's blessing, my old foundation was broken up and I saw that my righteousness could not save me. My chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth and followed thee. Do you have the gospel point? You know, you can talk about Jesus as an exemplar, you can talk about Jesus in all sorts of ways, but he's your, your savior and only he's your savior. Not your intensity, not your being sold out, not, you've gotta be a gospel pointed community. That's where the vitality comes from. Number two, 
You've got to be a heart-shaping community. Now, let me do a little theology on you, but it's very important. A heart-shaping community. This, I know, is going to probably make you all think. St. Augustine had an understanding of, what's, of, of, the, of uh, how people change that is radically biblical. I'm going to give you three things that he said, and these are all very biblical things. Number one, who are you really? You're not mainly what you think, and you're not mainly what you do. You're mainly what you love the most. That's who you really are. What you trust the most, what you hope in the most, what captures your imagination the most, that's who you really are. That's the first principle. The second principle is the things we love the most are out of order. We don't love God supremely. We love him third or fourth. Things that we should love first, we love third or fourth. Things we should love third or fourth, we love first. That's our problem. Our loves are out of order. We love some things too much. Good things, but too much. Some things too little. Thirdly, the only way then ultimately to change is not just change your behavior, change your thinking, it's changing what you worship. Because who you are, who you really are, is what you worship the most, what you think about the most, what you fantasize about the most, what, what you hope in the most, what you love the most. Now, there's all kinds of Christianity that doesn't understand that basically the seat of all this is the heart. There are many people who say, well, if you want uh, to change a person's life, you've got to teach them the right beliefs. It's as if, as if the seat is the mind. There are other people who say you have to move the emotions, and an awful lot of Christian ministry moves the emotions. But if you read the Bible carefully and you look up the word heart, you'll see it's something that really doesn't make much sense to us. Sometimes the Bible says we think with the heart. Sometimes it says we feel with the heart. Sometimes it says we decide with the heart. See, when you and I hear the word heart, we think of the seat of the emotions, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible sees the heart as the, 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 the control center of the life, the things that you're most committed to, that you love the most, that you trust in the most, that you're most committed to, and whatever it is that your heart is most committed to, that affects your thinking and your feelings and your actions. See, Jesus says, it's what you treasure the most, there's your heart what you imagine the most, what you dream about the most. Do you want to know what you really love the most? When you don't have to think about, imagine your cell phone's dead. You're waiting on the corner for somebody. There's nothing you have to think about. There's nothing, you got nothing to read, you got nothing to look at, okay, and you're just alone with your thoughts. What do you think about the most? What do you, what do you naturally tend to think about? Is it God? No. What do you think about? Archbishop William Temple said, your religion, your real God, is what you do with your solitude, where your, where your thoughts go, what you enjoy spending time thinking about, daydreaming about. And here's the problem. If you just go after the emotions, if you just go after the mind, if you just go after the will, you're not going after the heart. There's a kind of preaching that doesn't just tell stories and move the emotions, doesn't just give arguments and try to persuade the reason, but goes for the heart. It's a combination of all those things. It's a combination of all those things. And basically what will change you is a kind of worship, a kind of preaching, a kind of use of the arts, a kind of music, a kind of way of doing worship that doesn't just move the emotions and doesn't just change the mind, but actually shapes the heart. Now, I could, I could spend the rest of the time on that. You're saying, well, wait a minute, I'm not sure. I, you know, I would say almost every kind of church I know is too cognitive or too emotional or too volitional. Too much emphasis on do this and go out and do it. Too much emphasis on believe this. Too much emphasis on feel this. But nobody brings them all together. And if you want to be a church in the city, you've got to have a heart-shaping ministry. You don't just talk about Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ clothed in the gospel. Okay, third, you've got to be an indigenous church. Where are we, by the way? A gospel-pointed community. Secondly, a heart-shaping community. Thirdly, thirdly, an indigenous community. Now, here's what I mean by that. You need to convert the non-Christians who actually live near your building. <laughs> I 
Most churches grow every other kind of way. Every other kind of way. Generally what happens is churches grow by recirculating the saints. You know, some churches get better preachers, some churches get worse preachers, some churches get better music ministries, some churches have worse music ministries. They go through cycles and we just recirculate the saints. The evangelicals just move around, the Pentecostals move around from church to church depending on who's hot. And it's very quickly, we, 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 I mean, there's all, look, most of the, so many of the new churches in New York City, so many of the new churches, they're brand new and they're growing, but what they're actually doing is that they are, they are attracting disaffected evangelicals from the Midwest and the South who moved to the city and have one foot out the door, but because they're hip enough, they keep them. But are they actually winning secular New Yorkers who've lived there all their lives? No. Now, some of this is ethnic. I never forget the time. I went to see, uh, some years ago, we were trying to find a place. My church is in Manhattan and we were outgrowing uh, the, our rented facility. So we went to a church, which is a Ukrainian, this is a perfect example, a Ukrainian church. And we went in there, we saw that there was just not, not too many people in it, and it was a very big building, said, we, could we rent the church on the, on the, you know, in the afternoon? And uh, this is a church that had been built there years ago when there were a lot of Ukrainians around, but now, this is 60 years later, most of the Ukrainians are, who go to the church are older and they drive in. And they said, well, no, that, that, uh, how, well, how many people would you have? And I said, we'd fill the place. We'd, We'd fill the place. We, all 600 seats would be filled in the afternoon. They said, well, where would people park? And we said, what do you mean park? Our people live right here. They just, they would walk in. They don't park. And they said, you mean people who live here go to church? And I said, well, no. Until you convert them, then they go to church. How do you actually convert the indigenous people, the people who actually live near where, you're, where, you, where you meet, the people in your community, how do you do that? Well, let me just tell you a couple of things that will scare you. Though, well, here's one thing that won't scare you. At least 25% of your people have to have these four attitudes. At least 25% of your people have to have these four attitudes. Here they are, and here they go. The first attitude is, all I have to do is find them so I can read a, we affirm that it's hard to believe. If you're having trouble believing, we don't say, what's the matter with you? Why don't you believe? You know the book of Jude, verse 22? Be merciful to those who doubt. 25% of your people have to say, look, we understand it's hard to believe. And they're good to people who doubt. They're, 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 they're patient with people who doubt. They don't get down and say, why, aren't you, why don't you believe this? Secondly, they're not tribal. They resist the natural human tendency to have all your good, their good friendships amongst people who believe just like they do. Uh, you know the place in Matthew chapter five, verse 47, where, people, where Jesus says, if you greet only your own people, how are you better than anyone else? In other words, 25% of your people not only are merciful to those who doubt and are understanding, and understand what it's like not to believe, and they remember what it's like not, not to believe, but they're not tribal. They have deep, strong, deliberately cultivated relationships with non-Christians. Third, they don't interrupt. They don't interrupt. They listen long and long and long and hard to people's doubts and troubles and the reasons they don't believe in Christianity. And they listen so long that when they turn around and tell their non-believing friends what, they be, what, what, what their non-believing friends, ha, what their problems are, their friends say, you say that better than I can. You can express my doubts better than I can. And then fourthly, when they do tell their non-believing friends about Christ, they do it in such a gracious way and such a loving way that even though what they're saying is offensive, their manner is not. If 25% of your people are, uh, have those attitudes, you'll actually be starting 
to become an indigenous congregation, a congregation that actually reflects the community around you because you're actually converting the people who actually live there. And um, here's something else that's important to keep in mind is uh, evangelism is getting harder and harder all the time. And I, I believe that an urban church especially is gonna have to spend a lot of time thinking about it. Don't have time to go into it right now, but I found, recently I found a, uh, uh, a little article by C.S. Lewis that is almost nobody remembers anymore, which is hard to believe since everybody's always talking about him, including me, especially me. Um, however, he wrote, a, he wrote uh, yeah, here it is. He wrote an article some years ago in the 1940s called Modern Man and His Categories of Thought. And in it, he points something out. He says that 2,000 years ago, when Paul and the, the apostles were preaching the gospel, they had three kinds of people to preach to. They preached to Jews, they preached to Gentile God-fearers, that means Gentiles who believe the Bible, and they, and they preached to pagans, the Greeks and the Romans and the pagans. He says what they all, all of those non-believers had in common was this. They believed there was a supernatural world, they believed there were moral absolutes, and they actually believed that uh, the past had been better than the present. In other words, C.S. Lewis says, all people, non, all non-Christians believed that there was a God, there was a supernatural, that uh, we stood in judgment, that we were sinners, that, uh, that we were fallen. And then uh, C.S. Lewis says, now realize today, Never before in history, never before in history of, a, of humanity have we had to try to convert people who didn't at least accept that. Instead, we have modern people who believe increasingly, by the way, and increasingly young urban people are believing this too. Even non-white urban people are believing this. That basically you can't learn that much from the past, that was just primitive. That the only, dog, only thing you can be dogmatic about is you can't be dogmatic about anything at all. That uh, history is constantly in flux and things are constantly changing and whatever is true now is not going to be true later. Lewis says no one has ever had to evangelize people like this before, not even the apostles. So if you think evangelism is easy, it's not going to take a whole lot of thought. It will take a lot of thought. Okay, so... Gospel pointed community, heart shaping community, an indigenous community, city loving community. Here's what I mean by city loving. Uh, how do you help your, your congregation love the city? Boy, that term, we're using it, but it can be easily misunderstood. It can be really understood in a superficial way. Four kinds of people I see who live in cities, big cities, four kinds. Commuters, survivors, consumers, and natives. Listen carefully. Commuters, you say, oh yeah, they're the people who drive into work. No, 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 no. Commuters are people who move to the city just to get something done. It's a tool. They don't dislike it. They don't like it. They're here in order to get something done. They don't really care about the city. They don't, it doesn't bother them. They don't really love it. They're just here to get something done. Even though they're living here, commuters. Secondly, survivors. These are people who don't like the city. They're here because they have to be and they can't wait to leave. This is true of sometimes new immigrants that come in and they can't wait to get to more prosperous, get out of here. This is true of a lot of people who just don't like the city, but they're here because they have to be. Thirdly, consumers. Ah, the consumers are people who say they love the city and they, come, they love the diversity of the city. They love the energy of the city. They love the opportunity of the city. And they're the ones that say how much they love the city and Christian churches in the middle of the city very often are filled with people who say, I love the city but actually they love their experience of the city. They don't really love the city. They don't care about the streets. They don't care about the schools. They don't care about the infrastructure. You know, they don't care about the transportation problems. They don't, they don't love the city. They love their experience of the city. It's a giant theme park for them. And then finally you got natives. And actually, you know, I moved to the city 25 years ago, the big city, but I've raised natives. I got children and grandchildren. And I see that the danger with natives is that you appreciate the city. You don't romanticize the city. You don't hate the city. But you know, you also can kind of take it for granted and you can even be a little congratulatory that you survived. 
And you might be a little too assimilated to it, a little too much. What you need is lovers of the city. Now, where do you get lovers of the city? Well, you get them from the other four groups. You gotta, you gotta make them. As a church, you've gotta bring, you, inside your church, you've got commuters, you've got survivors, you've got consumers, and you've got natives, and you've gotta turn them into lovers. What does, it, what does it mean to love the city? Two things, number one, serving the city. Not just enjoying it, serving it, giving yourself to it, caring about its social arrangements, caring about the justice of the city, caring about the neighborhoods, caring about the city itself. But the second thing is, you should love the city not the way the consumers love it, not the way romantic, you know, people who just come and they, they're starry-eyed, oh, what a great place it is. You should love the city the way you love your spouse after 40 or 50 years of marriage. Let me tell you something about that. Some of you know what I mean. A lot of you have no idea. When you first fall in love, you are attracted to what can nicely be called many, many beautiful superficialities. And after 40 years, they're gone. <laughs> Those beautiful superficialities are gone. And yet, and yet, the, the really deeper goods you've come to see, the deep great things about your spouse you've come to see. Yeah, sometimes you say, it'd be nice to get the skin back be nice to get the figure back. But that's, they were the superficialities. And you just look for the deep things. And a lover of the city doesn't just serve the city. A lover of the city loves the city for the deep things, not the glitz. And what are the deep things? I'll give you three. A Christian who loves the city, first of all, loves the city because the poor are here. And you can see Jesus Christ in the face of the poor. Not only should you as a Christian want to, to pour yourself out for the poor? You should, if you get involved with the poor, you will come to respect them. You will come to see the gods at work among them. You will also get to see that they have things to teach you. You'll get over your paternalism and you'll see the beauty of the fact that rich and poor and middle class are brought together through Christ. Uh, one of the great things about the city is the poor are here, okay? They can be very miserable, but they can also teach you. And they have their own joys and their own beauties. And pouring yourself out for them because they need you just like you need them is beautiful. Secondly, the, other, the second thing you wanna love is not just that the, the poor are here and ministry to the poor, that's, it's a great, I love the fact that the city's the place to minister to the poor. Secondly, do you have an evangelistic heart? If you have an evangelistic heart, you gotta love the city because, there, because there's more image of God per square mile in the city than anywhere else in the world. Image of God, human beings, right? Uh, you know, the, the heavens declare the glory of God, which means the trees, mountains, the ocean. The Bible says that reflects the glory of God, but not like a human being. Human beings are made in the image of God. We reflect the glory of God in a way that the mountains do not. Mountains do show us something about God, but nowhere near as much as a human being. And because you've got so many human beings here, if you love people, you have to love the city. And if you don't love the city, it's because you don't love people and you don't have an evangelistic heart. They're all here. They, you know, the, the people of the world are moving into cities much faster than the church is moving into cities. So you, you love the city because of the, of the deep things that are beautiful, the fact that the poor are here we can minister to, the, the evangelists, uh, the opportunities of evangelists. But lastly, the cities are the place that basically sets the, the course of life as a whole. The city is the place that forms the culture. Do you care about how human life is lived in our society? If so, then if you're a Christian, you just come here and just do the work. Live your life, have the jobs, minister to people here. Otherwise, if we abandon the places where the culture is formed, then we're, we're abandoning the culture. If you care about how human life is lived in the world, you should be in the city. If you care about evangelism, you should live in the city. If you care about the poor, you should live in the city. And these are the things that a Christian comes to love, not the glitz. 
Okay, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. I'm gonna be going fast, remember? I said, it's gotta be a gospel. If you're gonna be a, uh, you know, if you're gonna be, a, be the church in the city, you have to have, a, you have to be a gospel pointed community, a heart shaping community, an indigenous community, a city loving community. Okay, a contrast community, a thick contrast community. What do I mean by that? You can't just show up in church, get some inspiration and leave. If you are going to really be formed as a Christian, if you're gonna be different from the people around you, you've gotta be in what the sociologists called not thin community, not thin church communities, but thick church communities. Thick church communities means you don't just come once a week and see one another and get inspired. You need to be deeply involved in one another's lives and you need to be a community in which people are being formed into Christians. Let me give you an example of this. Some years ago, and by the way, well, I'll say, some years ago, 2006, uh, a gunman walked into a one-room schoolhouse in Lancaster County, uh, an Amish schoolhouse, and took a bunch of kids hostage. Remember this, 2006? After shooting 10 victims, five of which died, aged seven to 13, all girls, he killed himself. Within hours after the suicide murders, I'm reading this from a, uh, an article, members of the Amish community visited both the killer's parents and exp both of the killer's parents and expressed sympathy for their loss and support for the hard days ahead. And when the gunman was buried a few days later, the young widow and her three children, in other words, the widow of the gunman and her three children were amazed to discover that half those attending the funeral were Amish. They showed nothing but support and concern for the murderer's family. They realized that she was gonna be going through hell. The Amish retained spokespersons um, and said, we completely forgive the murderer and his family. Now across the country, it electrified the country and all the newspapers were filled with people saying, that's how we should all be. That's, that's humanity at its best. But not too long, much longer after that, there were several sociologists, three sociologists who lived in the community, lived in the area, not Amish, but they lived in the area. And they wrote a book called Amish Grace. And they said, I'm sorry, our society can't produce people that could do that. Here's what they said. This is again from the article. The authors pointed out that at its heart, forgiveness is a form of self-renunciation. It means giving up your right to pay back. As sociologists, they knew that the Christian understanding is that the meaning of life is to give up one's ind individual interests for the sake of God and others. Christianity is all about self-renunciation. It's to give up one's freedom to live according to God's will and to the benefit of my neighbor. But this is directly opposed to how Americans are taught to live. We live in an individualistic, consumeristic society, a society in which we are taught over and over and over again, not self-renunciation, but self-assertion. Your freedom, your interests, your needs always come first. You have to do what is right for you. You have to look in your own heart and don't let anybody tell you that you can't do what you want to do. It's exactly the opposite of self-renunciation. It's self-realization. It's self-fulfillment. And they said any culture promoting self-assertion will usually produce re revenge as a response to any suffering while a counterculture like the Amish promoting, promoting self-renunciation will much more likely produce forgiveness. Most of us have therefore been formed by a culture that nourishes revenge and mocks grace, the authors conclude, and they're right. Now here's what they're saying. Where you live, who you hang out with, what messages you hear, what songs you sing, that forms you. And let's say, listen, I'm not trying to make lift up the Amish is the only way to live. But, but let's face it, they have a thick community. <laughs> they, they don't just show up once a week and, 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 and sing praise songs. They live with each other, they live with each other and therefore the messages, the music, the, the, the stories, all go around self-renunciation. But you and I, when we walk away from this place and we watch commercials and we live out in the world, we're being told self-assertion, self-assertion, self-assertion. What's gonna happen when someone really wrongs you? Are you gonna be able to forgive? Or are you gonna have revenge? It depends on what your real community is. Is your community, are, the church, are our church communities thick enough? 
Are they strong enough to produce people of integrity and generosity and chastity and, 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 and you know, very, very different than the way in which people in the world live? Do we hang out together enough or do, are we together enough? Are we in each other's lives enough so that we actually are, that your primary community is your church? Only that, only that, only if we do that will we become a contrast community. Okay, sixth, a servant community. Now, actually, I don't have to say much about it, but I do want to say there's an issue here. Uh, all the stuff that we were, we were looking at on the videos is really exciting. Christians have to be famous for caring for the needs of their neighbors. Christians have to be famous for caring for the needs of the poor. They've got to be famous. However, it's extraordinarily important that you not, you not slide into either fundamentalism or liberalism. You don't slide either into the idea that doing justice is basically all Christianity is about or that evangelism is all that Christianity is about. All I'm trying to say here is that's the reason why I'm saying you've got to be a servant community, absolutely, but you've got to keep these things together. They have to be kept together. I'm running fast. Seven, you've got to be a unifying community. What do I mean by a unifying community? Uh, I'm really happy to see how diverse the crowd is. Essentially, uh, what Together LA wants to do is really vital. You have storefront churches in poor communities. You've got middle-class churches that aren't really reaching their neighborhood because they're ethnically different than their neighborhood. You've got bilingual Asian and Hispanic churches with the younger English-speaking congregation kind of culturally at odds with the older uh, Spanish or Korean or Chinese speaking uh, congregation. You've got young hipster, uh, largely Ango uh, uh, churches, and they're all in here in the city. And every one of us probably only sees our part of the urban world. Maybe we're a little too locked into our part of the urban world. We don't see the rest of the urban world. The church needs to see us being together. I'm not saying, by the way, the theological differences aren't important. When we get together, very often we're going to find, oh, even though we all believe in Christ, we're pretty different. Even the way we worship is kind of different. You know, uh, sometimes I go to these urban congregations because I'm white. Um, you know, I'm watching, I'm looking at the clock. We've been singing for 15 minutes. Okay, let's get on to something else. And, and the non-white people are saying, no, no, we just got started. Look, th there's cultural differences, there's theological differences, but we need to, as much as we possibly can, show the world our unity. The church began in the West by defining itself over against other churches. You know, in the past, the reason I was this is because I'm not that. I'm Presbyterian, not Baptist. So that's why you should come to my church because we're different than the Baptists, because we're different than the Catholics, because we're different than the Lutherans. You heard, you heard the story about the guy who was, who was uh, shipwrecked on a desert island, right? For two years, but he survived. But when they came to pick him up, they discovered that he had built two church buildings, two little church buildings. And he went into one every Sunday <clears throat> to read his Bible and worship. And the ship's captain who picked him up said, I don't understand, why did you, why did you uh, uh, build two buildings? And he says, well, every Christian needs one church to go to and one church to stay away from. <laughs> That's how you know who you are. That's how it used to be. It can't be that way anymore. We shouldn't be defining ourselves over against other Christians. We should be defining ourselves over against the world. And when the world sees us doing that, it's beginning to see what Jesus said in John 17 was one of the great witnesses, one of the great testimonies to the, reality, the spiritual reality of the church is that when the world sees us being one, then they'll know he was sent. We were sent, that, G, that God sent Jesus Christ into the world. <laughs> gotta, gotta finish. I said a lay equipping community. We're gonna talk about this more tomorrow. Uh, in the early days of the church, there was so much persecution that non-Christians did not show up 
in church services. That's not, how, that, that's not how they became Christians. That is not how they became Christians. You couldn't, you couldn't have, non-Christians didn't show up in church. You weren't even allowed to, by the way, have non-Christians come to church because you never were sure whether that person was an informer or not. How did Christian people become Christians? They didn't go to hear the preaching. They saw the lives of the, of the Christians, the individual lives of the Christians. It is absolutely crucial that we learn to equip lay people in three areas so that when they're gathered, they're being equipped, but when they scatter, they're being the church. They're being the church as much scattered as gathered. We have to equip them on how to really share their faith with secular people who question everything. We have to equip them to care for the poor and the needy in the most visible ways. We have to equip them to integrate their faith with their work so that when they work, they're actually working distinctively as Christians. They're not sealing their faith off from the way in which they work, but they're bringing the basic understanding of, of reality that comes from the gospel into their work life. Lastly, we need to be a suffering community. You know what I mean by that? Three things, all under suffering. We haven't suffered that much in Western culture. Christians haven't suffered very much. But let me just, uh, to say that we, if we're going to be a great church, if we're really gonna reach the city, we have to be a suffering community means this. First of all, we have to be a great place for sufferers. The secular world does not know what to do with suffering. See, secular people have to live for something in this life. They have to live for their children. They have to live for their job. They have to live for their pets. They live for something in this life. So when suffering comes along, suffering can destroy their meaning in life. Several anthropologists I read recently said that modern Western culture is the worst culture in the history of the world at preparing people for suffering. Hindus do it better, Buddhists do it better, Christians do it better, but secular people have got nothing. It, they, they, there's no meaning. When suffering comes, it just destroys their meaning in life. Christians have gotta be places where people can suffer and where people are cared for when they suffer. And Christians have gotta be people who, who are known for helping the suffering. Just a few years ago, when there was that massive earthquake in, in China, massive earthquake in China, only five to 10% of the Chinese population are Christian, but over half of the volunteers that flooded into the earthquake ravaged sections to help the, the sick and the dying and the hurting were Christians and it was noticed. Christians were faster than anybody else to help the suffering. In ancient times, when the great plagues went through the Greco-Roman cities, Christians stayed in the cities, even though they knew that they were going to be perhaps uh, infected. And a lot of them died taking care of the pagans who uh, were sick. The pagans ran. Sometimes they, just, they, they were so afraid of contagion, they left the, some of their family members just in their houses and they, they went for the hills, but the Christians stayed there. They took care of, the, of everybody who was sick. Many of them died taking care of the sick. Like Jesus, they died that others might live. And it had an electrifying effect on the world. We've gotta be a place where we can take suffering. If we are persecuted, we cannot be too success oriented we, ha we can't worry that much about whether or not we're people like us. Uh, David Martin Lloyd-Jones was a, uh, let me finish with this. David Martin Lloyd-Jones is a great preacher, British preacher. And when he was almost dead, he was sick and dying. People came to him and said, how do, what do, you, how do you like being on the shelf? You used to be famous. People used to come and hang on your words. You wrote all these books. How are you handling that? And he quoted Luke chapter 10. Rejoice not that the demons are subject to your name, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. And he's talking about the place where Jesus sent his disciples out and he gave them power to, to cast out demons and to heal the sick. And they came back and Jesus said, how did it go? And they said, wow, Lord, even the demons are subject to our name. Like, man, this is great. And Jesus says, rejoice not. That's a command. Don't worry about whether you're, you're popular. Don't worry about whether you've got power. Don't worry about whether your life is going well. 
All that matters is your names are already written in heaven. See, there's the gospel. It's not like if you live a good enough life, maybe you'll get into heaven. Your names are already written there. They're already engraved there. You're already, you're already in. The verdict is already in. That is the only thing that matters, in which case you can take success or failure. You can take persecution or approval. We've got to be a place where sufferers feel at home. We've got to be a place where we lay ourselves out for suffering. We've got to be a place where we show that we can take suffering. And then we really will have, we will really be a church that can reach and love and serve this city. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.